Eleven years ago, my husband heard John on a radio show um, hosted by a man called Tom Likas. Who you local guys may have heard of Tom. This is before Tom became a potty now. And he was a, a semi-normal guy. And John, uh, Jeff heard John on the radio. We were not married at the time. And he uh, said, gosh, Sabrina, you can't believe this guy. He was so great. You know, he went out and got the book. He read the book really fast, like within a couple of days. Then he gave it to me. So Jeff, Jeff became a vegetarian first, <laughs> two days before I did. But it took Jeff the whole book to become a vegetarian. I was vegetarian by the second chapter. I didn't even need to finish the book to become a vegetarian. One of the things that really touched me in John's book was the story he told about chickens. And it reminded me, when I was a child, I had pet chickens. And these chickens were enormously friendly, intelligent, affectionate animals. And I thought they were special because they were my pets. I didn't make a connection between those animals and the animals that end up on a plate. I just thought, OK, those, those are chickens that are made for food. They're different. When I read John Robbins' book, I realized, no, those animals are not different. Those animals are the way they are because of the way they're treated. My animals were special and sweet because I loved them and took care of them. Those animals would be exactly the same if they had that kind of care, which they don't. So the chickens grabbed me, and I became like an instant vegetarian. So uh, because of John, Jeff and I became vegetarian together. Our children are vegans, and many of our friends have become vegetarian. When we started Veg Source five years ago, we didn't know John or his family, but we dedicated it to John Robbins because we felt such a debt of gratitude to him for bringing us into this really wonderful lifestyle. And we called John the prophet. We kind of, it was like, we really deified him. And then we met him. <laughs> and he was even more wonderful than we could have imagined. Though he did use words we didn't expect him to use. <laughs> I didn't expect the F word to come out of John <laughs> Anyway, John, it, we called him the prophet, and, we, and frankly, we did see him as this very kind of Gandhi-like creature. John in person is a very earthy, friendly, very funny guy, which you'll find out when you hear him speak. And his, uh, he's actually just recently become a grandfather also. And he has a... two adorable little twin babies. I also have twins, so it's kind of like we have a shared connection, twin connection there. We know um, John's wife, Dio, who is just the most lovely person you can imagine. And his son, Ocean, and um, Michelle, his wife, are just the sweetest, the sweetest people. I mean, you can, you can see um, with the, the life they have that Ocean and Michelle had that they are really a tribute to John and Dio. Anyway, so Diet for a New America is just an enormously inspiring book. And it's like you read it, you're going to be a vegetarian. It took John Durable to turn me into a, a vegan, but John, John Robbins turned me into a vegetarian. So here we are today, 2001, and John has written a new book called The Food Revolution, which really is a sort of a sequel to Diet for a New America. And it's very, very hard hitting, and it's just so chock full of information. It's just an astounding book. So um, John Robbins to us, uh, he is just a personal hero, and we just really love him and his family. And we're so thankful that they came here this weekend. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our friend, John Robbins. sound quality from this mic? Is it as good as you were getting with the other one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's louder? You want it louder? You want it louder. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how's that? Is that loud enough in the back? A little bit louder for the person in the very back. But now it's too loud for you, right? So we'll get it. Yeah. Well, it's good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> how are you feeling? Let me hear a couple of words. Just one word, how you're feeling from a few people. Just say it. Great. 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 Amazed. Amazed. Inspired. Inspired. Encouraged. 
Rejuvenated. Encouraged. Rejuvenated. What was that? <laughs> Cold. <laughs> Cold, yeah. How can we be cold? The air conditioning is up, right? Could we turn it down? Is that possible? Does, does anyone in the room have control of that? Not that cold. Not that cold. Not that cold. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. A few other words for how you're feeling tonight. I want to get. I want to feel where you are. Wonderful. Wonderful. Stuff. Changed. Changed. Validated. 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 Inspired. Inspired. Optimistic. Optimist. You're a really depressed group. <laughs> this is what happens. This is what happens when you tune your life, isn't it? You know, you start to live in accord with natural law and natural principles and the wisdom of creation itself, you know, it, it, these ter you, you get these afflictions of joy and creativity and uh, you, you, you could, I actually was on a, a television show recently in Los Angeles and they, they, the guy asked me, well, what are the downsides of a plant-based diet? What are, what are the problems? What are the side effects? <laughs> and, and I said, well, you, you could possibly just come up with just balanced episodes, you know, of, of joy, happiness, <laughs> vibrant, ecstasy, I, I don't know. And I, it's, but he, had, he saw it that way, he wanted to know what the side effects were. So used to medical treatments, which typically do, of course, convey side effects. I have learned that MD does not stand for medical deity. Um, though some of us have been culture, enculturated to, to, to see a white coat and, and supplicate ourselves um, and give our power away in that sense to a, a technology or a system. And that's one of the reasons I, I really am proud and, and feel honored to be on the same podium, in a sense, as Dr. McDougall, uh, as, as uh, Colin Campbell, um, because these are people who are using um, Western science and Western medicine, you know, in the service, not of the system itself, but in the service of health. And truly teaching the, the skills and the arts of prevention, preventing disease by building health in the first place. And, and we're all very lucky and fortunate uh, to have access in our lives, and contact in our lives with such people, because what they bring, the gifts that they share, um, should never be underestimated, the value of them. Sometimes it's only when we lose our health that we finally grasp the importance of it. And then sometimes it's a little late to take the steps to regain it. But why should we wait till then to do the things that bring us connection to our, our hearts and our souls and the, the vibrancy of our bodies and the, the well-being of every cell in our bodies personally and collectively. Why should we wait for that? You know, maybe we're the ones we're waiting for. And we don't have to wait any longer. Because we can take the responsibility for who we really are and the magnificence within us. And the beautiful consequences of doing that. One of the things that I have found so marvelous is that the, the same food choices that Dr. McDougall is talking about and has been talking about for years, and that he's been using at his clinics to help people regain their health at an extraordinary level without using drugs. The same food choices that Dean Ornish has been using as, the, as a pivotal piece in his program, taking people with advanced stages of cardiovascular disease, people who in many cases are too ill for bypass surgery, people who have severe angina, and reversing the disease, not just arresting its progress, which would be already marvelous enough, but actually reversing it. Through lifestyle choices, the centerpiece of which is this, this kind of food choices. And, then, and what's amazing to me is that these same food choices that, that are so much, that, that do so many wonderful things for our bodies, both in preventing disease and if one is already ill in, in, in serving to help treat them and reverse them in many cases. Those same food choices 
are the most compassionate in terms of the, the whole earth community, the most sustainable, the most earth friendly, the most environmentally benign and beneficent, and allow the most other human beings to be fed. This is a staggering and remarkable fact because it lines up. You don't have to choose between what's in your self-interest, truly, and what's better for the world. The lie of our culture is that we're separate. And that we're so separate that what serves you doesn't serve others. And you have to choose between your well-being or your self-interest and, and being kind or loving or concerned or helpful or responsive, even to the experience and plight of others. It's not true. The truth is we're much more connected to that. And the other lie of our culture that I want to puncture, that I want to expose, that I want us to see for what it is, is that you don't matter. And I don't matter. And the people around you who are sitting around you don't matter. That we don't matter. That the choices we make and how we live, the attitudes with which we experience life, don't make a difference. Because, according to the lie, according to the, according to the cultural trance, according to the separation, the forces at work are just so huge, and we are, and you are, and I am so little, and so irrelevant, compared to the massive momentum behind the problems. They are so intractable, and we are so puny, but you might as well just go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> That's the lie. It always matters who you are. It always matters the choices you make. Whether you lash out in anger or reach out in friendship, it makes a difference. It makes the difference. And whether you choose to live in a way that's dishonoring of the, the brilliance within you, or choose to live in a way that expresses your, your unique genius and the gifts that you have, that you bring, your particular talents, your particular heart, <coughs> makes a huge difference. And as the years go by, these two paths become increasingly divergent. And one leads to a, a life of passive resignation and defeatism and cynicism and bitterness and hopelessness and all of that that we see in spades around us in a culture that has bought into that lie. But the other path leads to something very different, something very much more joyful, and it, and it, it partakes of the sacred. It really does bespeak reverence for life itself, the gift of life. And this is what I think is so marvelous about this, this kind of work, and I appreciate you very much for coming here to be part of this. In the last, um, when I wrote Diet for how many of you, by the way, have read Diet for New America? Uh, how many of you have read The Food Revolution? When I wrote Diet for New America in the, in the ensuing five years after its publication, beef consumption in the United States dropped 20%. Oh, yeah. I'm delighted to be part of that because you can translate that drop in beef consumption very directly into how many square miles of tropical rainforest, for example, were destroyed that, that otherwise would have been, and with that, how many species are still with us that otherwise would have been extinguished? And how many cultures, indigenous people, still have habitats, still have a margin of existence, still have life that otherwise would have been obliterated? You can translate that into how many fewer heart attacks have occurred in this country. How many fewer cases of cancer? How many fewer strokes? How much less suffering there is than there would have been otherwise? You can translate that into how much less polluted our water and air is and how many fewer animals had to suffer the obscene conditions of factory farm, animal factories and feedlots, <coughs> and the, the inhumane slaughter that is institutionalized in our meat packing plants. You could translate that into so many goods that to me that's cause for celebration when we see a reduction like that. 
And there was a time a few years ago, actually about the early mid-90s, I was on a national public radio show opposite a, uh, a representative of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And he was paid to be there by that organization, and it was set up as a debate. And it was quite contentious. And uh, the uh, moderator at one point announced that fact, but I just told you that beef consumption had dropped 20% in the five years after the publication of Diet for America. And the, my adversary uh, pointed at me at that point and screwed his face and said, it's his fault. <laughs> I was proud. <laughs> I do not take credit for that. You deserve credit for that. All of us who are being part of this movement and this a voice for this change are part of it deserve the credit. And we can just, and, but, but I was proud at that moment and, and glad uh, that it was happening. But what's happened since, in the last five years or so, is we're seeing that that, that decrease in beef consumption has leveled off and even started to creep back a little. It's plateaued. And you know what I'm talking about. You're seeing the, the, the Atkins diet being so popular. I know the John McDougal talked about that earlier. And, and, and we're seeing this kind of backlash in the culture. Which is one of the reasons I wrote The Food Revolution. Because it's time to put a stop to that backlash and reverse that, that uh, indulgent in course. Um, because so much depends upon it. The health of our, of our children and, and the viability of the biosphere itself. And whether or not we can say we're creating a world that reflects the aspirations and caring in our hearts. Because if we're living a life that doesn't reflect our love, then I think we're, we're out of touch with ourselves. And I think that is what breeds violence. That is what creates the soil in which a psychotic madman can take root and grow. And the, the importance today, as, as never before, of learning to live with respect for life, with, with, in a non-violent way, with ahimsa, with reverence and respect and appreciation for the opportunities life brings to us, and for each and every soul that we encounter, and for our, the, the beauty and the love within ourselves, and how that, that love and that need for expression of that love meets the world's needs. It's never been greater than that. And where does it, how do we learn nonviolence? How do we live nonviolence? How do we teach nonviolence by the very way we breathe and live and practice our lives? It, it has to take place in our lives, not just our words. It's not just about saying nice words. I, I have people who have said to me at times, well, I can eat meat, it's fine, because I, I pray over the meat, I bless it. <laughs> Now, I, I love prayer. I, I love giving voice to, and, and I love what others do, to, to the, the deepest aspirations of our, that live in our hearts. I think that's wonderful. At the same time, though, if your life isn't a statement of what's living in your heart, then to me, that's a problem, that's a wound that needs to be addressed for us to be whole. And so to me, to take it, the, the, the corpse of an animal that's been treated the way animal the way livestock are treated in today's factory farms and, and feedlots and slaughterhouses, deprived of all of virtually everything it needs for even at the basic decency of a life. Uh, in many cases, put into a living condition, a cage or a confinement situation, barely larger than the size of its own body, immobilized for its entire life virtually, and in some cases, literally. And then killed with a, in an assembly line of institutionalized death that makes no effort to, to, to uh, reduce the animal's pain or suffering, unless it's profitable to do so. And then to take that flesh of that animal and think you're blessing that spirit of that creature I just don't think the animal's all that appreciative. <laughs> you know, I don't. And furthermore, what about the rainforests that are being cut down? You know, what about the, the, the uh, pollution 
water pollution, the air pollution that's ensuing from our factory farms. So much of that is preventable. So much of that is needless and, not, and it's not something we don't need to contribute to in our lives. And now there's another uh, factor that's part of the stew, part of the realities of our food choices and our, our way that we're producing our food and distributing it in this country particularly. That's genetic engineering. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because it's a real big issue. And unfortunately, Dennis Kucinich, the congressman from Cleveland, isn't going to be with us uh, this weekend. But it, it, it had been hoped that he would be, and expected actually up until yesterday that he would. And Dennis is uh, a good friend of mine and of ours, really. And he has been for the last three years introducing in the House uh, legislation to uh, require the labeling of genetically engineered food. And in the Senate, corresponding legislation has been being introduced by the senator from this state, Barbara Boxer. And each succeeding uh, session, these bills have gotten more and more co-sponsors, which is the way you mark the development towards passage, and that's a wonderful thing. And I want to tell you why I think that's so important. It goes quite beyond informed consumer choice, although that alone would be sufficient. <coughs> But what is happening in genetic, what are, what are we genetically engineering foods for? Why is it being done? The PR tells the public, and I'm sure you've been exposed to this, that it's being done to produce foods with higher nutrient levels or to feed the hungry. Have you seen ads saying that? The Biotechnology Industry Organization, the BIO, has right now uh, in operation a $50 million publicity campaign, PR campaign, to convince the American public of that. That if you are standing in the way of genetic engineering, if you're requiring labeling or want to see labeling, for example, you are an enemy to the world's hungry because this is our best hope to, to uh, increase yields. This is what, what the um, PR said. Well, if you were in fact uh, genetically engineering seeds to produce crops that were and your effort was to respond to world hunger, there's certain characteristics you would predictably be seeking to evoke or develop in your plants. The ability to produce greater yields, for example. Uh, to grow in marginal soils, perhaps to tolerate, to tolerate, dr tolerate drought better, or saline conditions, more alkaline soils, or more acidic soils, a greater range of soil conditions. To grow... Uh, and, and prosper without expensive inputs, such as large-scale irrigation schemes or um, massive inputs of uh, synthetic fertilizers, because those are costly, and those are in short supply, of course, in those parts of the world where uh, poverty is greater and where hunger is greater. These are the characteristics that you would be obviously seeking to develop. The reality is that of the now 100 million acres growing genetically engineered food in the world today, not even a quarter of 1% of that acreage, if that, is growing crops with any of those characteristics. What has been developed, 70% of the 100 million acres, 70% of the genetically engineered or transgenic acreage in the world today is growing crops that have been engineered to tolerate massive and sustained oversprayings of herbicides, particularly Roundup. That's Monsanto's proprietary best-selling herbicide. They are called Roundup-ready crops, particularly soybeans and canola, but also cotton and corn. Roundup-ready soybeans now dominate the U.S. soybean crop, 70% or so. 65% of our soybean crop is Roundup Ready. It's Monsanto's genetically engineered soybean. So if you're going to get soybean uh, foods, foods containing soy, unless it's organic or specifically non-GMO, it's guaranteed to contain genetically modified substances today. The Roundup Ready soybeans get lower yields, significantly lower yields than conventional soybeans. But you can spray them. Once the plant is already growing, you can still fly over it with a crop duster and 
and spray Roundup. And it will kill every green plant down there by um, altering the, and uh, disrupting the uh, photosynthesis of the plant. But it won't, won't kill the Roundup ready soybean. So this is what they're doing. And that's 70% of, of, our, of our genetic land genetic acreage of 100 million acres. 25% uh, are growing crops that produce pesticides in every cell of the plant throughout its entire life cycle. In the root hairs, and the roots, and the stems, and the leaves, and the, the, the flowers, and the pollen, and the seeds themselves contain throughout the entire life cycle of the plant, biocides. Now this is particularly done with corn and cotton too, because the, the caterpillars, the corn borer and the, the cotton beetle, tend to munch on the, the leaves of these plants. And so this way, they munch, they die. And the, the growers think that's great. And um, this is why it's being done. But it's also, as I mentioned, in every cell of the plant, and that includes the part that people eat. So for several years, Monsanto uh, developed the, what they call the new leaf potato. It's a form of a russet potato. And McDonald's was using it for its french fries for two years. Burger King was also for about a year and three quarters. They don't do that anymore. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But this was a potato that was engineered to produce a pesticide in, in every cell of the plant, including the, the, the potato itself. The potato was so suffused with this pesticide that it literally had to be registered with the EPA as a pesticide itself. <laughs> but McDonald's was using it in its french fries and Burger King without telling the public because we don't have labeling. So we didn't have to tell the public. People were eating pesticides, calling them french fries. And the only reason they stopped is because they were afraid of the public learning about what was being done and what the implications were. And from a PR point of view, they decided that wouldn't look good. <laughs> So they don't do that anymore. That's, it's good that they don't do that, but I'm showing you what, what's being done. That's 25% of the genetically engineered acreage in the world, 100 million acres of which I'm talking about. So we have 70% of it is herbicide resistant. These are plants capable of tolerating and which are then uh, exposed to massive uses of Roundup and other herbicides, weed killers. In fact, when this technology was brought into commercial production, the, in order to allow it to occur, to be deployed commercially, the, um, the FDA had to triple the allowable residues of Roundup's active ingredients in the food that you eat, which they did. Not because they had any new evidence that these active ingredients were less poisonous or toxic than they had expected or believed. Not at all but merely because that was what was required for this product to be employed commercially. They did it as a favor to Monsanto. And this is typical of how the FDA has been operating. 70% herbicide resistant, 25% is pesticide producing. What about the other 5%? Those are plants that have been genetically engineered to have both those characteristics. <laughs> so that's what's being done in the world of genetic engineering. And, you know, in the last few days as, um, and weeks, as we've been, uh, all of us, feeling the reverberations of the crisis and the events of September 11, and there's been an increasing awareness of the many ways that, that germ warfare could be, or, or, or biological agents or chemical agents could be dis disseminated to or horrific, catastrophic consequences. We, we, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Authority, has grounded the, the crop testing uh, planes. I'm sure you're aware of this. Uh, because these are planes that could be used. They are in any way used to spray the fields with uh, primarily herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, mildewicides, a host of biocides, poisons, all of them, onto our food. And they could be used for you know, hideous purposes. What I would like to ask you is, do you see any reason or sanity in grounding them permanently and switching to organic agriculture? <laughs> I'd like to see that. 
I really would. And, but genetic engineering is, is being conducted by the, the companies, the agrochemical companies such as Monsanto. That are the, the, the companies that sell and profit from the sale of uh, synthetic fertilizers and, and also pesticides. The, the, the five largest genetic engineering companies, biotech companies in the world, are the five largest pesticide companies in the world. This is the same people. And they're doing it uh, hand in hand with and to promote the sale of Roundup, for example. Um, meanwhile, the techniques that they're developing, because these companies are spending many, many hundreds of millions of dollars annually on research and development of genetic engineering. Uh, they, they, they spent nearly a billion Monsanto to develop the Roundup radio technology. Um, this is a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of genius, frankly, a lot of human genius is going into this, a lot of research time and, and money, labor, to develop the technology to enable us to have the ability to alter and manipulate genomes uh, with increasing sophistication uh, and increasing ability to exploit and control. As they are developing these abilities, we collectively are becoming more capable of altering the genomes of bacteria, uh, viruses, of plants, seeds, of human beings and other animals. That same technology in the wrong hands can be used, and I assure you is under, there are people trying to use them today, to alter the um, genomes of specific pathogenic bacteria to enable them to be weaponized. In, in the times past, anthrax um, and so forth, these pathogenic microbes, spores, it's very difficult to disseminate them, to disperse them uh, in any, with any control at all. But by, through genetic engineering, the ability to manufacture a, a weapon out of them is increasing. So this, to me, is another reason to stop the genetic engineering companies right now. And if we get labeling, we will stop them because people won't buy it, and they know it, which is why they're fighting labeling. Because, you know, labeling is just, I mean, we label everything in the food, pretty much, and, you know, it tells you how much salt, salt is in everything you buy, every packaged food, mm -hmm. isn't it? But the, 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 the natural design has been altered. That, that's, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> you know, so I, to me, there's just all these implications. You see the way that our, our lives interweave with greater planetary destiny in so many ways. If you look, you see the dimensionality of things. Life takes on a richness and an importance that it really does have and contain. And the choices that we make individually and collectively, and the choices that we make collectively are the product of the choices that we make individually. To me, the, 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 um, the front line of the, the, the effort and the struggle for a sustainable and just and, and a thriving world for all. The front lines are the human heart. And you can say, well, but why, how can what takes place in my heart, in my little life, affect these great problems? And the answer is because we are connected. Because that line of separation doesn't hold. It's just an illusion. And it doesn't honor the truth. We are part of each other's hearts and dreams and needs in ways that the separate thinking of our culture doesn't recognize it, doesn't enable us to appreciate it. But it is true. It is the basic fact of our existence. And when we learn to live from that and take responsibility for our part in that, something beautiful starts to take place. And this is what what is so crucial that we know and appreciate in each other, that we, that we, we appreciate the, the little steps that people around us are taking. They may not be the steps that are larger as you would like them to take. You know, as you would like them to become a vegetarian. They're just, I had someone say to me, I read Diet for America. I've cut down on the amount of bacon I eat every day. <laughs> you know, I, I, there's a part of me that, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if, you, if we can't recognize and appreciate each other for the positive steps, where are we? So I said, that's great. 
that's great. And the guy smiled, and we had a connection, and who knows down the line where that step will lead that person. Whereas if we put a, if we say, no, no, that's, well, you, should, you have to become a vegan. You mean you still eat honey? <laughs> it's like, how, how are we gonna, you know, we, we have to welcome people. It's really important. And, and one of the uh, things that I think is really important for people in this movement to, to uh, keep in our awareness about this is that what is happening, what we are doing is we're finding our voice, uh, each of us. And by our voice, I don't mean just the words we speak, though that's certainly included, but the way we live as a statement, political statement, a spiritual statement, uh, and, and finding our voice, finding our expression of, of who we truly are, and what we are becoming together, is a powerful thing. And as it happens, we will not all sing the same note. This is very important. Harmony is developing because we're not singing the same note. And uh, we need to listen to each other so we can be in harmony. But we do not ask that the other person do exactly what we do or think exactly the same way. Some of us will be vegan. Some of us will eat more raw food. Some of us will be more microbiotic and, and be inclined to eat more cooked food. Some of us won't be vegan. Some of us will take smaller steps. But the movement to a sustainable world, the movement to a humane way of life, the movement to a compassionate statement is something we can celebrate in all of its forms, and we need to, because we're that big a movement, because our hearts are that inclusive, and because that's where we build coalitions and develop the strength to have the kind effects that we want to have. So I welcome every step, including this guy who said, you know, I cut down my bacon a little bit. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Maybe tomorrow, another, you know, another step, you know. And maybe I sometimes say to you, well, that, that is great. That, that's like cutting down smoking from two packs a day to one pack a day. That, that's a good thing. That's a, you know, and I hope that, you know, together we can cross another bridge. You know. But I don't want to, I want there to be these bridges. I really do, and, 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 and the, the, one of the, and the reason I'm saying this to you, is, and, want to, and kind of coming back to it, is that I feel this is a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a potential uh, pitfall in our, in our movement, if you understand what I'm saying. I know this can be a, a sensitive area, but I was wondering what the impact is of carnivorous pets on total meat consumption in our country. I don't see data. Yeah, yeah. And what can be done either to. You're asking about carnivorous pets, pets and the impacts there. Dogs and cats are different. Dogs are much more omnivorous. They actually are uh, uh, omnivorous. And to, to have a vegetarian or vegan dog is actually quite possible if you work out a little bit. We, we did it for years. We had a dog, or, you know, and, and many years ago. And uh, I know a lot of people who have been very successful uh, with dogs. And they're very healthy. The dogs are very healthy uh, without feeding them meat. Cats are much harder. Uh, they're much more carnivorous creatures and are much harder. There are people who have had success with veggie cat and other supplements. There's a woman in New York, um, Sharon... Um, Jiva Mukti Yoga Center, she runs, uh, Sharon, um, that, but she's, she's got a whole book out about it, and she's got a bunch of cats, and I think, Kali, have you done that with your cats? It didn't work. Didn't work. No, they were not healthy. They were not healthy. So cats are much harder, uh, particularly older cats are harder to make the transition. Um, you know, it's not a perfect world, and we do the best we can. I, sometimes people say, that, well, it, I had a friend say, gosh, if everyone was vegan, we wouldn't have this problem laden and everything. And I, you know, I, I, if everyone was vegetarian, I don't think it would be a perfect world. It would be a better world. It, it would be a much better world. But we go as we go. And uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges. The love that people get 
in their lives from companion animals uh, can make all the difference in some people's lives. And I really honor that and appreciate that. Um, in our family, we, we have a cat. Actually, it would be more accurate to say he has us. <laughs> I mean, he has us trained. We feed him, we pet him, we do everything for him. I don't quite see why we think we have him. Uh, the chicken, he decides where everybody sits. He decides who gets what wakes up when. Um, oh, completely. But, um, and we feed him a food, a, you know, commercial cat food, although we also give him a lot of vegetables that we cook and make up for him as well. And it's a trade-off, you know, I, I am sorry to say that there's products in slaughterhouses in that, in that uh, cat food, I know that. Better to at least know it than to pretend otherwise. Uh, and then we do the best we can. Can you give me some advice on how to respond to certain carnivores that I come in contact with that think because they eat kosher meat or free-range meat that like it's okay and it's like the animal's yeah. not suffering? How do you respond to those people that think they're doing so good because yeah. they're not eating factory farm meat? Well, if someone is eating truly free-range animal products, I do think that is a step, like I was talking about the person eating less big, I think it is a positive step. I want to acknowledge, I'm not going to antagonize that. I think that's a positive step. There is less suffering involved in that. Um, and this, it's a healthier thing for that matter too. Free range animal products contain more omega-3 fatty acids, significant more. But, you know, the question I'm always asking is, how do you honor the heart? The, the heart. The great heart, the common heart, the heart that's given the heart that's given birth to us in the first place, from which we draw everything good in ourselves. And how do we live in a way that, that builds that strength and that, that, that type of energy in our lives? And I just ask people, how, how, how is, is this doing that for you? And I don't I don't set it up as a, an argument, I don't try to argue with these people. I thank them. I say, and you know what else? You can be even healthier without that. That's what the data show. It's not just my opinion. That's the results of the most exhaustive medical research, the most scrupulous research. Um, stuff like Dr. Campbell has done in the China study. Uh, just extraordinary results showing that the fewer, and because the animal products eaten in China are not, for the most part, of the factory farm stuff that we have in this country. So that data is not uh, obvious, is not negated in any sense by free range. Because that data is based upon basically free range types of situations. Um, so the, the, what we know is that as you reduce the amount of animal fat, and animal protein for that matter, that you're running through your bloodstream, you, you lower your risk of cancer, you lower your rates of heart disease, you lower your rates of, of, of hypertension and diabetes, and all kinds of conditions that ensue from the, the, the standard American diet. And what a, what a lovely opportunity that we have to be even healthier and even more compassionate. And so, would you like to? Eat, you know, I say, would you? How, how would you like to? Uh, let's have a vegan Tuesday. You know, I think it's great. But I don't set it up as an argument because I'm trying to appreciate the spirit of goodness in everybody. I really am trying. I don't always do it. <laughs> a lot of times I fail, but I get back up. Fall down, get back up. John, I, I've only been a vegan for uh, about seven years, but I find that in that time I've become a more compassionate person when it comes to things like you know, hunting and wrestling and all sorts of things that I just yeah. don't care for anymore. Um, I'd like to know do you remember before you got involved with uh, veganism, were there changes that you noticed? And if there were, do you think that there? Um, scientific, medical, because of the chemistry, or do you think that it's all spiritual in your head? Hmm. I think it's both. Uh, it's been a long time for me, and I'm remembering it when you do that after about 35 years. Uh, but, and I was young, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, yeah, for me, the shift was part of awakening to the reality of life on Earth. Um, and what's going on, the anguish, the planetary anguish and pain, the cries of animals in slaughterhouses, uh, the cries of, of hungry people, hungry children who die because of lack of food, well, 
also where there's abundant resources, just one place. You know, the, the, the pain of, of, a, of, a, of a biosphere, of a, of a life support system being, being eviscerated, being polluted, being destroyed, that, upon which all future generations would depend for a viable life. And, and, and then one generation feeling <clears throat> it's okay to just devour it in different forms. The pain of that. And then the cry within me for some form of response in my life. Some form of, of, of honesty in relationship to what is actually occurring in our world. And so uh, that, that's what it was for me. And I think that is a spiritual, uh, in the sense of human, not in the sense of spiritual, in the sense of leaving over and, and ignoring, you know, getting above or beyond, but in the sense of honestly addressing engaging with, in a healing way, uh, to the problems and to the pain of it all. And I think there's also very measurable biological markers for this. Uh, so hormones, stress hormones. For example, if you're eating the animals that are, are, are living in our factory farms a few months today, you're eating the flesh of animals whose lives have been so cooped up, so confined, so reduced, that those animals are full of fear. And then they're killed in a manner. No effort is made to, to shield them from what's ahead of them in the, the slaughterhouses. There's a lot of effort made to shield you from seeing it. You can look at Farmer John's uh, in LA, all these murals, these incredible pictures saying, showing happy animals. But inside, the animals are just in this assembly line. And they see what's coming, and they smell it, and they hear it. They sense it, and they know it's what's happening. And they secrete what we call fight or flight hormones, uh, adrenaline, but also uh, other similar substances that are secreted by the adrenal glands that course through the bloodstream and, and enter the musculature to enable those muscles to contract very rapidly, very powerfully, and immediately so that that animal can either run for its life or fight for its life. That's what we call it, the fight or flight reaction. Very powerful thing in, in, in animals. Possibly more powerful in, in these other animals that we eat rather than, than in humans because they are closer to their instincts than we are in certain ways. And yet in the slaughterhouses, uh, they are not allowed to, to run. Obviously, they're restrained. They're not allowed to fight. They're restrained. They're not allowed to do anything with those the, the, with the biochemistry of terror that has rapidly entered the musculature. Instead, they're killed, and those compounds remain in those muscles, uncombusted, and we call those muscles steaks. We call those muscles McNuggets. And if you are someone who, who, who resonates to the prayer, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. If you're someone who wants your life to be coherent, with, with the energies of peace everywhere. If you're someone who wants to be able to respond to the stresses of, uh, and the emotionalities that come into your life with, with serenity and equipoise and clarity and groundedness and this sense of center rather than being pulled off by every which way thing that occurs, what sense does it make to fuel your cells continually from the flesh of animals when that flesh is bound then to contain the physical embodiment of that terror, the fear. Are we that separate from these animals that we won't ourselves be uh, influenced? I think not. I think we're much more connected with animals than we sometimes know. When they appear in our dreams, it's often as bearers of extraordinary energies and powers. All the native peoples know that. And when they appear in our lives, also true. Yes? How do you deal with the attitude that being vegan makes a man wimpy? When in fact, <laughs> when in fact it, makes, it, makes, it makes you stronger. How do I deal with the fact that being vegan makes a man wimpy? <laughs> I don't have that problem. <laughs> um, you know, 
vegan men tend to be leaner. I guess they're real significantly leaner than, than uh, non-vegan men, and particularly in this culture, as a rule. And, you know, we kind of are used to seeing people who are, frankly, overweight as the norm. We're carrying a lot of animal fat in their, in their own bodies. Not even their own fat, it's the fat of another animal that they eat, and it's just there now. Carry around with them. And, and uh, so we're used to seeing that. So when a person is really trim and, and slender, we may think that they're skinny or weak or, you know, and but is that the case? The, the extraordinary uh, success of vegan athletes is something that I, I appreciate a lot. Um, I and mean, we see this in all kinds of athletics, including weightlifting, by the way. Um, and, um, Dave Scott, I don't know how many of you know Dave, he's a, he lives in Boulder, he's the world's probably the greatest triathlete of all in history. He won the, the Ironman triathlon in, in, uh, on the west side of uh, Hawaii there seven times. Um, and he's a, he doesn't compete in that any longer, he competes in Masters triathlons and wins them. Real, 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 real famous, real class guy. And I don't know, when Barry Sears wrote um, the zone guy, I, I bet you tell people talked about very seriously. <laughs> so I don't have to do that. But I'll tell you one piece of it that I doubt John said, although maybe he did, but, and that is that when Sears talks about um, his diet and how great it is, he, he talks about Dave Scott and says that Dave Scott, you know, that it's Dave Scott's magnificent uh, uh, accomplishments, which are a matter of public record, uh, prove that his diet is so great because Dave Scott follows his diet. And I, I read that and I thought, that doesn't, I don't, I know Dave. He's been in my house. We've talked time and time again. I've never heard you mention anything about that. So I called Dave up and I said, Dave, you know, I'm very serious since. He says, I know. He says, I hate it. He says, it's the biggest lie I've ever heard. I said, well, you mean, how can he say that if it isn't true? He says, that's what I like. I've never even read the guy's books. I don't even know what his diet really is. I don't, I, I don't agree with any of the points he's making, as far as I understand them. I never followed his diet, and I wouldn't be interested in trying. So I'm a proud of being in your book, he said, but I don't want to be in a very serious book. I said, well, have you ever tried to communicate with very serious about this? Have you ever met him? Where did he get this idea? He said, I don't know where he got the idea. I did appear with him once at some conference, and I shook his hand. <laughs> and he says, but I've been trying to get him to, to, to not say this for years. I have written him, I have called him, and I have emailed him, and he hasn't replied and responded. I said, Dave, would it be all right with you if I mentioned this in the food revolution? Look, I'm working on it. He said, please do. I said, are you, are you and then I said, okay. And so then, but then when I, after the galleys, we did, I wanted to check in with Dave again. I said, call him up and I said, okay, here's what I wrote, Dave. I quoted it. Now, everything I just told you. He said, great. I said, you sure you want this out there? I said, oh, absolutely. He said, I've been trying to get this guy to stop saying this for years. Dave Scott, you know, is doing okay physically. <laughs> He's not what I would call a wimp. Now, I don't know how many vegans you're going to see on WWF. <laughs> but that's maybe a good thing. There aren't going to be too many vegans playing NFL football, probably. Or, you know, but there is one, he's a heavy, not a heavy, I think he's a middleweight boxer, world champion boxer, Keith Holmes. Keith Holmes, yeah. Yeah. World, world champion, vegan boxer. Now, I'm not a really fan of boxing myself. I don't consider it a sport because the effort is to, to harm. So I don't don't uh, go there myself. But it just shows you. I, I wouldn't call him a wimp. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and besides which, besides which, let's ask what real power is, hmm? because the cultural lie, the trance, defines power, male power particularly, as the ability to dominate, to coerce. To subdue, to, 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 to control, to, to exploit, to dominate in different forms. To me, that's not real power. That has nothing to do with power. To me, what power is, power is the ability to bring forth life. 
to respond to and nurture life, to bring out the best in each other, to cooperate, to liberate, to befriend, to nurture. That's power. The power of a, a woman giving birth. The power of mother love. The power of father love. The power of our hearts to embrace the wounds that we carry and the beauty that we are and bring forth a world worthy of our being here and all the pain we've gone through and the, the tears and the, and the prayers of all the peoples that have come before us and the dreams of all those yet to come. That's power. That's the power I pray for. That's the power I, I give my life to. You know. And while I'm at it, I go to the gym and I bench press almost one and a half times by eight. I feel good about that too. But I, <laughs> I it's like that, it, 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 but, but power, you know, let's be careful about this word wimp. Reminds me of the word sissy. You know, it's like there's a nanny, you don't want to be called a sissy. It's like the worst insult. But then what is this? It comes from the word sister. Sisters, brothers, we're all the same family. And some of us maybe not have the physical strength to, to uh, play in the NFL or something. Big deal. <laughs> you know, the strength of a person's heart, strength in, you know, to care. Because you see, we've all been disappointed by other people. We've all felt betrayed. We've all felt violated. We've all felt disrespected. And many of us have felt abandoned at key points. And some of us close down and become bitter and make that into a, 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 a philosophy of life. Why I'm bitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and others of us use the pain of that for self-realization, for growth, and to expand our, our connection and empathy with, with the pain of other people. And that's power. 